So, as usual, we're going to start by doing some meditation together, and then we get into a Dhamma talk, and then we'll have some Q&A towards the end. So, and we'll see what happens as we go along. So, as usual, make sure you are nice and comfortable. There's going to be about half an hour's uh, uh, Dhamma talk, uh, sorry, uh, meditation. And just to have a nice and comfortable body, this is not about torturing yourself. It is always about finding a, a nice, peaceful state within that always starts with the body being at ease. So make sure you are nice and at ease, comfortable, no pains, and you can kind of breathe easily, no tensions within or anything like that. And uh, make sure you take a lot of time at the beginning, uh, just to really relax, really be at ease. Uh, if you feel any tensions anywhere in the body, uh, if you have tightness in the muscles or tightness anywhere, uh, just imagine yourself breathing in through the tightness. Uh, this is especially true, of course, for the uh, stomach region, uh, but anywhere in the body. Uh, you can imagine yourself breathing in through the tightness, uh, and as you breathe out, you let go and you just relax the whole area, the whole part of the body. Yeah. And uh, to be able to enjoy the meditation uh, and to really relax, uh, it is important not to, uh, it's important just to accept things the way they are, uh, to go with the flow of things uh, and not to try to make the meditation happen. Uh, very often the very word meditation gets in the way. Uh, when we think of meditation, we think we have to do something. Uh, but really think of it instead as just relaxation time or being at ease time, uh, having a good time time. Uh, that is the best way of thinking about this. So you can sit back, uh, allow things to flow, uh, and just allow things to go naturally, uh, not forcing it, uh, not trying to do the right thing, but just being. Uh.
One of the uh, great things about meditation practice uh, is just this feeling of not doing anything, uh, just resting in the present, uh, not actually activating the mind or anything in any way. Uh, and you will find if you observe this carefully, it's a very delightful state not to have anything to do. Uh, just being able to relax, uh, just being able to be at ease. Uh, and as you do that, you can gradually feel the energy return to the mind. Uh, it's as if you are taking a break from the world, uh, a holiday, not a fake holiday, but a real holiday from the world around us. Uh,
And uh, what a blessing it is in our lives uh, to have the Buddha's teachings, uh, to have little groups like this who come together, uh, support each other in our practice, uh, both in our virtue and kindness and generosity, uh, but also as a support for meditation itself. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is to have like-minded people like this in the world. Uh, this is what makes the practice possible. Uh, and so try to see the delight and the beauty uh, and the wonder of having good friends uh, in the Dhamma teaching. Yeah.
Okay, everyone, so just take a minute just to review your meditation, uh, try to understand the process, uh, the things that make you peaceful and calm. Uh, Alright, so uh, that's the uh, meditation for you, just to get ready for the Dhamma talk, just to uh, get a bit of clarity of mind, etc. And so we can take it from there. Now the, uh, the topic for today's talk is about the benefits and pitfalls uh, of renunciation. And this was a topic that was suggested to me. Uh, I'm not sure if the person who suggested it is here today, but, <laughs> but never mind. That's how it often goes. Uh, uh, but uh, it's a nice topic, yeah. and uh, it is a focus on, you know, on things like the monastic life. Uh, the monastic life is often what we think of when we think about the idea of uh, renunciation. Uh, but um, the monastic life is really just a particular expression of that renunciation. It's an outward or external expression of that. Uh, but of course, the real renunciation is a mental thing here. Yeah. It's about giving things up mentally, and that is what then actually is the path of practice. And that sometimes uh, is expressed in monastic life. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, monastic life. Uh, what are the benefits of the monastic life? I don't know if any of you are interested in that. Uh, maybe you will be interested after this talk. That's kind of the, the idea. See what, <laughs> see what happens. Uh, and uh, uh, also some of the dangers, some of the pitfalls of monastic life, because not everyone thrives in monastic life. Uh, and it's important to kind of try to understand why that may, might be the case. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the general idea of what renunciation actually means. Uh, now, the first thing uh, I want to just uh, briefly address, and that is the thing about the word renunciation itself. Uh, I don't know about you, but to me, the very word renunciation sounds a bit forbidding. Yeah, yeah? renouncing means like uh, foregoing something. It means like giving up something. Yeah? It means like depriving yourself of something, right? Uh, and sometimes when we hear about the idea of renunciation in certain traditions or certain religions or certain whatever, it is almost like you give things up, uh, but you don't really expect anything in return. It's the kind of the giving up for the sake of giving up. Uh, maybe because something is considered bad or whatever it might be. So the word renunciation sounds a little bit dark and it sounds a little bit like we are not really, we wonder why we should renounce. Uh, but uh, in Buddhism, uh, the, uh, actually the word is actually a very positive word. Uh, and the Pali word is uh, the word nekama. Uh, and the word nekama, quite literally, it means like non-sensual or non-sensory. Non-sensory is maybe even better uh, because it is about the idea that you are kind of letting go a little bit of the world of the five senses. Uh, that is kind of the point of this. Uh, and of course, uh, the Buddhist teaching is such that when we let go of one thing, especially when we let go a little bit of the sensory world, uh, there is an alternative that arises in its place. Uh, and that is really the critical issue. Uh, so it's not giving things up for the sake of giving things up. It's giving things up for the sake of aspiring to something greater, something larger, uh, a greater kind of expansion of consciousness or a joy in the mind uh, or a sense of peace that comes from giving up the restless search for ever more sensory uh, attractive things, etc., etc. Uh, so the idea of giving up the sensory world is a very, very positive thing in Buddhism and it's conjoined with all of the uh, positive sides of renunciation. And this has very uh, practical consequences. 
One thing that it means is that we should always, when we do try to renounce things, we should do all of that renunciation in a very balanced way. We should not renounce without feeling that we have some return from that renunciation. So really the process of renunciation should be almost like an organic process, something that grows by itself, yeah, just by uh, practicing these teachings and kind of using these teachings in the right way. Yeah? And when it is an organic process, you will find that you live your life well, you live with care and kindness, you have a degree of generosity in life, you enjoy doing service for other people, you sit down in your meditation and you start to get some peace, you start to get some joy coming up in your meditation. Yeah? And of course, when that joy comes up, you start to understand that one of the reason is because you have given up something else. You gain something in return. And then the idea of renouncing even more kind of becomes natural, right? Because it's actually, you understand the joy of renunciation. Renunciation is great. It's the best thing that ever happened to you. The rest of the world thinks renunciation is for foolish people, but you know, it's exactly the opposite. Renunciation is actually for the people who have some understanding of spirituality in a deeper sense. So actually, it is a very, very beautiful thing. And we should not be put off by the word renunciation. It is really just in English that this word can have, can have, not always, but can have a negative connotation. In Pali, it just means non-sensory or non-sensual. And it doesn't really have any negative connotations at all. If anything, it's positive. So um, what does this mean uh, in you know, from a monastic point of view, uh, yeah, why is a monasticism a kind of renunciation and what are the benefits of that kind of renunciation? And maybe also what are some of the pitfalls of the renunciation of becoming a, a monastic? Yeah. And of course, when you do become a monastic, you are giving up quite a lot, yeah? And uh, this is precisely the reason why the monastic life is the ideal way of practicing the Dhamma. Because when you become a monastic, yeah, when you live this kind of life, you are approximating to the life of someone who is fully enlightened or fully awakened. Uh, yeah, the monastic life is about giving up certain pleasure, worldly pleasures, uh, certain worldly attachments. Uh, and it's quite close uh, to the ideal of those people who have gone a long, long way on the path. Uh, if you look at someone who is uh, you know, a noble person, an Arya or whatever, someone who has the full insight into these teachings, uh, they will want to live as monastics uh, because that is the natural expression of awakening. Uh, awakening is expressed uh, through the monastic kind of lifestyle. Uh, and so you will see in the suttas, in the word of the Buddha, the Buddha says that if you actually do achieve awakening, you can no longer live as a lay person. Yeah? And the reason is because you don't, you, you don't attach to kind of houses and storing up things and having your, you know, a larder full of food and these kind of things. You don't work like that anymore. Huh? So the moment you become awakened, at that moment, you also become a monastic in your heart at the very least. Huh? So this is expressed through that. And this is why one of the very important reasons why the monastic life is so powerful, because it approximates uh, approximate, so this ideal of what it means to be awakened. Uh, in a sense, you are uh, trying to live that life directly and you know, thereby renounce more things and thereby having success on this path. Uh, but there's much more to the idea of uh, uh, monasticism. Yeah, this is kind of the kind of broad outline of why it works so well. But I want to talk about some of the simple things that make monastic life very attractive. Uh, and uh, one of the most important things that makes monastic life attractive uh, is all the kalyanamitas you have, all the good friends, uh, all the spiritual companions that you have on the path. Uh, here at Bodhinyana Monastery, we have about we have over thirty monks now. 30 monks, right? It's really a large monastery and not so far, just on the other side of Perth, we have the nuns monastery with about 15 nuns. So 15 nuns, 30, over 30 monks. We have a couple of small monasteries as well, kind of in the area with, with two or three monks here and there. So it's very kind of, it's a very large kind of community. And of course, 
all of these monks and all of these nuns are heading in the same direction. So you have all these kalyanamitas, yeah, and when you meet with each other, you tend to talk about the Dhamma. They kind of, you, when you see them, you know, wow, you kind of reminds you of Buddhism when you see another monastic, right? You see the robes, you see the shaven head, you think, oh, I'm one of these two, okay, I better do the right thing or whatever. It kind of reminds you of these things all the time. And so it means that you are leaning towards the Dhamma so much more easily because you have these kalyanamitas. But more important than just having kind of a, a variety of kalyanamit, kalyanamitas who are on various stages of the path, if you end up in a really good monastery, you end up with teachers who exemplify the Dhamma, who exemplify what it means to be a monastic. And I feel incredible, incredibly fortunate to have a teacher like Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, you all know Ajahn Brahm. And I was always inspired by Ajahn Brahm from the very beginning, because when I saw Ajahn Brahm, I saw someone who was a real, who was a Buddhist in the full sense, someone who exemplified the practice, someone who was living the teachings, a living example of what the teaching looks like from outside when it has been internalized fully. That's what it looked like to me when I met Ajahn Brahm. And it is this beautiful, feeling when you are around a person like that. It's a beautiful and wonderful thing. And Ajahn Brahm often says that most of the Dhamma happens by osmosis. Yeah, And this is true. So when you sit together with someone who is very peaceful, someone who has a lot of kindness, someone who has this vibe, the juju, yeah, the juju is the modern word for vibe apparently, has this vibe about them that they kind of, you feel kind of the Dhamma in their presence. And this is a very, very beautiful. And you can just, sometimes you just sit there and you feel peaceful. You sit there and your mind turns from worldly things to Dhamma things just by being in the presence of a person like that. And this is one of the very powerful things about being a monastic, which actually is much, much more difficult to get in lay life. In fact, in lay life, it is, you, you can get it sometimes, but it is very much, much more hard. And, um, I do not wish to kind of say anything uh, bad about the lay people. There are some very impressive lay people in the world, uh, but uh, lay life is much more busy, many more things going on. Uh, and for that reason, it is much more difficult to get access to these kind of things. Uh. So the idea of kal Kalyanamitta is an incredibly good reason to become a monastic. Yeah? If, you ever, if, there, if, you, if there's no other reason, that is plenty good enough to enter the monastic life. Uh, because mon the whole Buddhist path starts with right view. Uh, it starts with having, having a degree of faith in these teachings. Uh, and of course, that comes from these people who are your Kalyanamittas, these people who are the Aryas, the noble ones. Uh, it arises from them. And so that... Uh, contact with that sort of people is incredibly important for that reason. Uh, so this is uh, one of the beautiful things about the monastic life. Another kind of very powerful thing about the monastic life is that the, uh, uh, the circumstances that you are in as a monastic, if you are in a good monastery, uh, are very conducive to the practice. Uh, yeah. In Bodhinyana Monastery, every monk has a little hut in the forest. And when I sit in my hut, I don't see anyone else. All I see is kangaroos and birds, kookaburras, the, laugh, the Australian laughing bird. And I see the grass and the trees, and I have a beautiful view in my, from my cutie. I even have this enormous view. You would be surprised that people pay millions to get this kind of views that I have from my cutie. And I just happen to have it. Why? Because I'm a monk. <laughs> benefits of being a monk, hidden benefits. But the main purpose is that you are secluded and you are away from the world. Yeah? You, are kind of, you have uh, animals around you, you have nature around you. All of these things are a great aid to calming down and to be peaceful. Yeah? You come out of the city, you come out of the towns, you come out of all the sensory realm and you kind of sit in your little cootie away in the forest. Yeah? And it's a very, very beautiful thing to have that ability. Yeah? But what is also very powerful about that thing is that while you sit in your kuti and you meditate away happily, the meal comes in cars yeah, from the city. The people drive all around out to Bodhinyana Monastery. Yeah. And then when I come out of my kuti, all that food is kind of offered to the monks. And then we get this beautiful meal every day, 365 days of the year. That is such a, not only is it uh, 
kind of wonderful to have that kind of support, uh, but it's actually very inspiring to see how the Buddhist community works together here. Uh, the idea of sitting in your kuti, people bringing all of these things for the monastics, uh, it's very heartwarming and it's very inspiring to see the kindness, the generosity, the service of the entire Buddhist community looking after you in this way. Uh, and you cannot avoid, you, cannot, you, you have to feel a sense of gratitude for these people because it is so, it's so beautiful. Uh, and of course, then you also want to do something in return. You want to provide a service in return. Uh, that, of course, is the idea of teaching the Dhamma to the world when you do this. Uh, so uh, it's a kind of, it's a lifestyle that brings out the best in people. Uh, yeah, when I am with lay people, I always feel that lay people are incredibly kind to me, incredibly respectful and all of these kind of things. Uh, yeah, it's very different in lay life. People are not going to be always so kind to you as they are in monastic life. Uh, and it's a wonderful benefit to have this uh, uh, affection and kindness from people around you all the way around the world. Uh, whenever I travel anywhere, whether it's to the UK or to, you know, anywhere in Asia or anywhere in Europe or North America or whatever it is, uh, it is always the same. Yeah, people are very, very kind and they treat you with a lot of uh, um, generosity and service and these kind of things. Uh, and it's a beautiful way of seeing the best in humanity. Uh, there is a lot of beauty in human beings. Uh, yeah, sometimes we just see the negative thing. There's a lot of good qualities in human beings around the world. Uh, and it's wonderful to be able to kind of tap into that and see that. Uh, and this is one of the wonderful things you see as a monastic. Yeah. So these are some of the things about being a monastic that makes monastic life incredibly powerful and very, very um, different in many ways from lay life. Uh, and uh, anyone who has a little bit of inclination to monastic life, I would really recommend you to try it out. Uh, go to a good monastery. Yeah. Go to a place where you feel inspired by the teachings, inspired by the people. Stay there for a while. Feel the atmosphere. Yeah? Try to figure out, maybe this is something for you. Huh? Why? Because if you don't try it out, uh, you may be wasting a massive opportunity to make incredibly fast progress on the spiritual path. Don't waste that opportunity. This is the life, yeah? This is the only life you've got. Maybe you have more lives in the future, but basically you don't know what's going to happen, yeah? Now is the opportunity. Yeah? So now take this uh, opportunity and make the most of it. Uh, but um, so uh, I really recommend uh, the monastic life at least, but you have to be careful as well, because sometimes people are too idealistic, yeah? Or they go about it the wrong way. Yeah? So um, how should one go about the monastic life? What are the pitfalls? What are the dangers uh, in uh, doing this? Uh, and uh, one of the um, dangers is that you don't, you follow your intellect rather than following your heart. Follow your heart when it, uh, when it comes to monastic life. Uh, it is very important that when you come to a monastery that you feel right, it feels right to you, it feels good. Uh, you feel at ease, you feel a sense that uh, there is harmony there, it's a place where you can feel happy, it's a place where you can easily meditate for yourself, uh, you feel that people are kind and caring in the right way. Uh, this is so important, uh, because if you don't feel at ease in a place, uh, if you don't really relax, if you don't feel that people are your friends, uh, it's going to be very, very hard to practice the path. Uh, if you feel uptight, or you feel people are a bit harsh, or maybe they can even be abusive, it is very happens in monasticism as well that there is abuse going on it happens everywhere because monast monasticism is just a reflection of the broader society so if you have that in society you're going to have it in monasteries as well but be, so be very careful follow your heart if a place feels right if the teachings feel right if the teachings accord with the suttas you feel good in that place that is probably the place where you should go and too often people follow the intellect. Yeah, they have this idea, yeah, if I go to this monastery, I want them to practice these particular rules. Yeah, they have to practice really, really kind of strict rules. And I want to see some serious ascetic practices. And I want people to be told off when I do bad things and these kind of things. If you come from your intellect and you have very kind of stringent ideas of what a monastery should be like, but you don't follow your heart, very likely you will actually end up being disappointed. In reality, there's going to be a little bit of intellect, a little bit of heart, but make sure that you enjoy the place. Otherwise, I can almost guarantee that your monastic life is going to fail. This is the first thing. The second thing that is really uh, matters for monasticism to work 
Ideally, you have some good meditation before you enter the monastic life. It is not absolutely required. The most important thing is to have faith, have confidence in the Buddhist teachings. And if you have that faith and you have that confidence, then the meditation will happen down the road anyway. So you'll be fine. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out one way or another. You don't have to be too concerned. But it is important when you come to monastic life that you uh, don't uh, suppress things. Uh, yeah? Sometimes people suppress things in their character. You may suppress desires, you may suppress ill will, you may suppress character traits that you feel not appropriate uh, in the monastic setting. Uh, and that is really the worst thing that you can do. Because if you suppress things, uh, really it, it will come back and bite you at some stage later on. Uh, and very often that very suppression means that you're not able to make progress on the path. Uh, so suppressing things is always a bad idea. So it's important to be in a monastery where you can be yourself, you can be at ease. Yes, there should be a degree of restraint, but there should not be suppression. And I've seen this happening for very many monastics. They go into a very kind of tough environment and they suppress things in their character. And after five years, 10 years or whatever, things kind of erupt. Yeah, and when they erupt in no long time, they kind of disrobe and they're out of the monastic life. This is sometimes called spiritual bypassing, yeah? where you bypass real issues in your life that actually need to be dealt with. Uh, maybe psychological or sides of your personality that you haven't really dealt with properly. And maybe you become a monastic precisely because you don't like that side of yourself or something. Yeah? And then you end up actually causing problems and causing trouble for yourself uh, because you do that. Uh. So these are some of the pitfalls. So one of the kind of uh, very important ways of avoiding these particular pitfalls uh, is actually when you enter the monastic life, uh, and this is also true for lay life in a sense, uh, is to ensure that you are making progress in your practice. Uh, and this is uh, one of those beautiful uh, sayings by the Buddha, which always kind of inspired me. Uh, very often we tend to be a bit um, uh, like uh, spiritually materialistic, yeah, we have this idea that we want to attain certain stages or certain states of meditation. Have you got a jhana yet? Yeah, or, you, or, or are you getting, you know, what are you, what is happening in your meditation and these kind of things. Uh, but uh, this is not really what the path is about because uh, you can have an attainment, you can have a stage, uh, but uh, and very often, if you get that attainment, uh, then it may stagnate afterwards. Uh, yeah? And if it stagnates afterwards, uh, what's the point of that attainment? So the Buddha says that it is not the attainment in itself. The attainments are, of course, important in, in a certain way. Uh, but what is the most important thing is that you are making progress. Uh, that is what really matters. Uh, and so when you enter a monastic life, one of the kind of great pitfalls uh, is that somehow you lose uh, a sight of this idea of making progress, or you get trapped into kind of various, um, you know, projects or various kind of things. And the moment not making progress on the path, that is when the path becomes meaningless. As long as you're making progress, there's the feeling that you are going somewhere. There's a feeling that you have a purpose. There's a feeling that the path is working for you. And that is so incredibly important. And if you do that, then you, fit, you, you have a sense that monastic life is worthwhile. The moment you stop making progress, even if you have a jhana state, even if you have some very profound meditation, chances are that eventually you will disrobe because the whole path becomes meaningless as a consequence. So focus on progress in your meditation. Focus on pro overall progress on the path. Are you becoming more mindful? Are you becoming more gentle? Are you becoming a more caring and compassionate person in the world? Do you feel that your samadhi is coming together? Is your ill will going down? Are the kind of excessive greeds, are they going down? And if you see this kind of progress in your life, then you are on the right track especially if you are a monastic. This is incredibly important. Uh, otherwise, the monastic life is completely meaningless. Uh, so this is the idea of uh, monasticism and why it is so important. And as I said initially, uh, monasticism reflects the highest ideal of what the Buddhist path is about. Uh, the highest ideals of the Buddhist path are about giving up, letting go. And this is what you are reflecting by living the monastic life, ideally, when the monastic life is well lived. It is not always well lived, but when it is well lived, that is what it does. Uh, 
But uh, as I said initially, of course, what we are really doing uh, is that we are actually, uh, when we are renouncing, uh, it is actually a change in mentality that really, what renouncing really is about. Uh, and one of the uh, kind of initial phases of the idea of renunciation uh, is the idea of living a moral life, uh, living a life of service, uh, living a life of generosity. Uh, and I would really recommend you, if there's one thing I would recommend you that is going to be incredibly supportive uh, for your entire spiritual life, career, if you like, call it a career, it's the only career worth having is a spiritual life, right? Uh, so forget about all other careers, uh, just move on to the spiritual life straight away. So if you're going to have success in your spiritual career, uh, uh, the one thing that I would really recommend you to do, uh, try to live a life of service. Uh, if you can live a life of service uh, where you always try to implement the ideas of morality, of kindness, of care, of compassion, of understanding in everything you do, uh, you're going to have an incredibly successful spiritual life. Uh, yeah, and when I say service, I mean this in a very broad kind of sense. Yeah? I mean this in a sense of uh, looking after the physical needs of other people, also yourself, of course, yeah, doing this based on compassion, based on understanding. Yeah? I mean, using your speech as a gift to other people uh, with a sense that uh, uh, you want to offer them something beautiful through the way you speak and the way you are. Yeah, this is kind of a life of service when you offer your speech to other people. Uh, or simply by um, uh, being generous and kind in your daily life yeah and kind of always being open to help always being able to serve in whatever way you can and when that attitude starts to go gets established in you the attitude of service it's a very very beautiful and powerful mind state that mind state of serving actually gives rise to so much joy and happiness within you the person who gains the most from the service is is not always the recipient. Very often it is actually the service provider themselves. Uh, it's a very beautiful and spiritual kind of mind state. Uh, and one of the things that always struck me in the sutta as the word of the Buddha that I thought was very interesting uh, was that some of the words that are used in the suttas for generosity are also the words that are used for enlightenment, for awakening itself. Uh, similar kind of vocabulary. Uh, and I always thought this is so fascinating. How can the simple act of being generous, how can the simple act of caring for someone else, giving something of your own, how can that be akin to awakening? Awakening is kind of the end of the path. Generosity is often considered the beginning. Of course, it's the beginning only in the sense that you start out being generous at the beginning, but actually generosity goes with you all the way to the end of the path. But the idea is that when you are generous, you are letting go of something, yeah? You are renouncing something. You're giving something which belongs to you, which is part of yourself, part of your identity, part of what you take to be mine. And of course, when you are giving up something which is part of your identity, you know, that identity, of course, from a Buddhist point of view, is an illusion anyway. It's not really losing anything. All you do is gaining something. But when you are doing that, that is akin to awakening, because awakening itself is also giving up your sense, your full sense of identity that you have within there. So generosity is like leaning in the same direction. Being kind, living a life of service is leaning in that same direction, leaning in the direction of awakening. So this in itself is an aspect of this whole idea of nekama of uh, uh, giving up, yeah? of letting go, of renunciation itself. Uh, it happens in this way, starting with such simple ways on the path. Uh. And then uh, after this very simple start of the idea of renunciation, then comes the renunciation in meditation practice. Uh. If you want to have real success in your meditation practice, uh, you are going to have to let go a little bit uh, of your attachment to the sensory world. Uh. You will start to understand that once you meditate, once you get a little bit of insight into how the process of meditation works, uh, it won't be long before you start to understand that there is a hindrance there, there is a problem that if you hold on to the five sense world, uh, meditation will be blocked to a certain degree. Uh, because the five sense world is always about the world out there, uh, whereas meditation is about going within. Uh, and if you are attached to the idea of going out into the world, there is no way you will be able to stay within. So there is a natural opposition 
between the five sense world on the one hand and meditation on the other hand. And you start to see this in your meditation. You start to see that the more you let go of the five sense world, the more peaceful you become because that world is so agitated, that world is so restless, that world is always moving around, going from one thing to something else. But the world of meditation is the exact opposite. And you start to see this opposition between the two and you start to want to renounce the world of the five senses. You become less interested in it naturally. But even though you do become more interested in it naturally, sometimes we can help the process a little bit. Yeah, we can kind of add a little bit to the process. And one of the things that we can do is do some of these beautiful contemplations that the Buddha talks about in the suttas that shows us the disadvantages of the five sense world. And I love to talk about this. It's one of my favorite topics because it is so beautiful when you start to understand what is going on there. But just to give you a very, very quick reminder of some of these uh, ideas. Uh, one of the ideas is the idea that uh, the five sense world is like you are a dog with a bone. Yeah, when the dog eats the bone, it never gets any satisfaction. Uh, all it does is kind of get the taste of blood on the bone, but there is no satisfaction there. And the five sense world is like a dog with a bone. There's no real satisfaction. Where do you find the satisfaction? in meditation practice, in renunciation. Isn't that the great paradox? You find satisfaction in, in renunciation. It's kind of weird. It sounds like the opposite of satisfaction, but no, it actually is about satisfaction itself. And then there are other similes about the idea of the borrowed goods. Yeah, the five sense world, we only have it for so long, then we have to give it up. The simile of the dream, it's like a dream world. We're always thinking about what we want to get out of this five sense world, but it never delivers on its promises, yeah? Et cetera, et cetera. There are a number of other similes as well, and I would really recommend you to look into those. So this is how renunciation works. Renunciation is beautiful because renunciation gives you access to something very, very interesting, very profound and very meaningful in life. This particular meaning that you get through meditation practice, this is where you start to feel that life has a real purpose, has a real aim. It's not just about going around in circles, never going anywhere. And the final act of renunciation uh, is the act where we let go of the sense of self. Uh, now the sense of self is this very thing that is so dear to us. Uh, it's the ego, it's how we relate to the world around us. Uh, it's a feeling of something very, very close to us. Uh, and it's very difficult for us to understand that this is actually a problem. Uh, this causes so much suffering in the world, the sense of self. Uh, we have some idea because we can see how the sense of self often leads to arguments. It leads to opposition between people because we, you know, we are, uh, uh, we cannot let go of our, of our ideas or whatever it might be. Uh, but uh, it's difficult to let go of. Uh, but the final act, which comes at the very, very end of the path, uh, after you renounce the interest in the five sense world, uh, when you get into some very, very deep meditation states, uh, you come out of those meditation states uh, and you realize of the emptiness of all phenomena. Uh, the idea that everything is just constructed in the world, it is made up, nothing is really lasting. Uh, everything comes from cause and conditions. Uh, when you get that insight into the natural reality uh, and you're able to see that the sense of self itself is a construct, it is not a reality. Uh, at that moment, that is when you do the final and the biggest renunciation of all that. And what is the result of that renunciation? The greatest bliss that you ever, ever had in your entire life. A massive bliss that lasts maybe for days afterwards because it is so powerful. And that is the renunciation of giving up the sense of self at the very, very end of the Buddhist path. And this is what you have ahead of you. This is where this path is going. And it really is just a matter of implementing these ideas. And uh, you, as you can see, the idea of renunciation from the Buddhist point of view is incredibly beautiful. Uh, and you just start to take the baby steps, uh, starting out with living a life of uh, service, of kindness, and all of these kind of things. Then you get into the meditation, you renounce more of the world, and finally you get the wisdom, the insight, uh, which is the final act of renunciation. And that is where the path comes all the way to the end. Uh, and you will be a very, very happy person, or maybe non-person, after that. Uh. So, uh, 
there you are. So uh, I have used up a little bit more than my half hour of talking. So please, if you wish to ask any questions, you want to make any comments, you're very, very welcome to do so. So please, uh, fire away as they say. Who's going to be the first one? Who's going to be the brave person starting out? <laughs> I've unmuted you. Hello, Adan. Hi. Um, ah. I have a question Melanie. about the. Uh, yeah, well, I'm Marian, but it doesn't matter. I have a question about the intermediate states uh, between the one death and the next rebirth. Is it the same thing? as the ghost realm and uh, you have like uh, i put it in simple words you have like people annoying you and people being nice to you uh, like interactions between things things that, or human beings uh, having effect uh, on the, the stream of consciousness or is it like uh, dreams and nightmares just perception but being i hope my question is clear Okay, I, I, it's a little bit hard to hear you, but I, I will try to answer. And if, you, if I don't answer, you can always come back if you like. So um, the, uh, the intermediate state is, uh, is uh, I think it is similar to maybe what you read about in near-death experiences. Yeah? The, the Buddha doesn't really explain in detail exactly how they, how they are, how it works. And I think it will vary enormously how long they last. Yeah, they can last for a very short time. Sometimes like you can be reborn straight away. At other times, it will take a bit of time. It's as if your karma has to ripen. and maybe you have to review your life and judge yourself or something like that. And then because of that judgment, then maybe the karma will ripen as a consequence. But it is probably in, in some ways, it is probably a bit like a, a it's like a disembodied experience. Yeah, you. So a bit like a ghost in, in some ways, but it's not the same as the ghost realm because the ghost realm is a realm of suffering, right? So if you get reborn in the Peta Loka, which is one particular kind of realm of rebirth, it is a realm of suffering, but the intermediate existence is not a realm of suffering. It is just a realm where you're waiting for kind of the, the karma to ripen for you to judge yourself or, or whatever it is that it takes you on to the future life. So can you meet beings there? I think you, you can. That's kind of what I understand, that you can actually meet beings there. So, uh, you know, when you, it's actually very useful, I find, to read some of these stories about people who have near-death experiences. Uh, it's actually very powerful. Have you read some of those stories? Uh, it's just really interesting. And I, I would really recommend people to get hold of some of these books. The most recent book that I'm aware of is a book called After, which was uh, published about a year ago or so. Uh, and uh, it's just extraordinary. I mean, you, you become privy to some very, very private aspects of people's lives. And these people were changed by having these kind of experiences. And we too actually get changed a little bit just by reading about these experiences. You don't actually have to have them. You don't have, you don't have to almost die. You can, you can read about some of these experiences and you will actually be, uh, you know, you will have some of the feelings that they had. Uh, these are very, very powerful and beautiful and, and, and interesting experiences. Uh, and basically what they are about, yeah, they are about this uh, process in between whereby you have the ripening of the karma. So it is like a ghost realm in the sense that you are more like a spirit, yeah, uh, but it's not, it's not negative, it's not a painful thing. Yeah? And uh, you can meet, it seems there, you can even meet other people who have passed away and all kinds of things. Uh, uh, but uh, generally speaking, it is a positive one, especially if you have been a good person, if you have lived a good life, you've been a good Buddhist, done the right things, then usually this experience is going to be very, it's going to be a pleasant one for you. Huh? Are you okay with that? I will unmute um, Madhu, and uh, if uh, Marion has another question, you can come back, Marion. Hi, Ajahn from Mali. Um, Hi. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, my question is on suppression and restraint. You mentioned suppression. You should not suppress our negative um, traits. 
but rather restrain them. Yeah. So could you clarify the difference? I have some idea, but if you could uh, clarify how, what's the difference between the two and um, to go about them? Yeah, I, that's a very, I think, very important question, because I think what happens is that a lot of people, they know how to suppress, but they don't know, they don't know how to restrain. Yeah, this becomes a problem, because suppression is like the first line of defense in our minds. When you, some bad thought comes up, you get angry, and you know this is not the right time to get angry. Actually, it's never the right time to get angry, but, uh, <laughs> but sometimes it's really a bad time to get angry, right? You, you are it's really inappropriate. Uh, and uh, usually what we do is we suppress, because we don't know any other means of doing it. Uh, and so the right way of dealing with it, uh, uh, using restraint, uh, is actually to use wisdom rather than using willpower. Yeah, and understanding that actually this anger that I'm getting right now, it is not helpful. Uh, it is going to be counterproductive. Uh, yeah, and uh, it, because it is not helpful, is it because it's counterproductive? Uh, what's the point of getting angry here? Uh, and sometimes that's enough to get the anger to kind of die down straight away because you know it's not going to achieve any good results. All the results of anger are usually negative ones. It may achieve some very immediate results, yeah, because people get a bit afraid of angry people, so they kind of maybe they will shut up, but they won't have any long-lasting results, any beneficial results. So um, just that that can be enough. But one of the recommendations that I would use, in, especially when it comes to anger and, and dealing with anger, is to always remember that other people are not really autonomous beings who are out to get you or to do the wrong thing. They are just conditioned beings and they do things because of their own inner conditioning is coming out in their conduct. They can't usually help themselves, yeah? I mean, I sometimes if you if I ask people, you know, try not to get angry for a whole week, they, they know it's impossible, they can't do that. And the reason they can't do it is because they're not in control of themselves, right? We're not really in control of our own minds. They are conditioned. So when you see someone else doing something wrong or bad or whatever, remember that they are conditioned to be like that. They probably can't help themselves. And the moment you see that, uh, if you understand this properly, uh, you will understand that instead of getting angry with a person because they are being silly or stupid, actually you should have compassion for them because they are trapped in this thing. They're trapped in this behavior, right? Uh, they can't help themselves. Uh, and someone who is trapped by their habits or trapped by their behavior uh, is like someone who is in prison. Yeah? And of course, if someone is in prison against their will, not understanding what is going on, uh, how can you not have compassion? Uh, and this is the idea of using wisdom. And if these ideas are kind of really deeply embedded in your mind, if you have reflected on these ideas again and again, so you have a clarity, you understand why they actually are real, why they work, while they reflect reality, they actually reflect the way people actually are. Once you get that, wow, it is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And you will, it's very difficult to get angry after a while, yeah, because you always see people in this way. And that is what I mean by, this is a powerful way of using restraint, yeah? using wisdom to stop the, think, the, the arising of these negative thoughts. Uh, and sometimes you may have to use a little bit of uh, just willpower as well, not always maybe the, the, uh, the um, wisdom power is going to succeed, but if you want to use will, uh, willpower, then don't suppress forcefully, just hold back, don't act on the anger, right? It's, it's more like stopping the action rather than actually stopping the anger. Because if you stop the anger itself, then very often what you're doing is you're just suppressing. It doesn't really give any good results. So, so just stop the actions that come from that uh, and then try to use wisdom to overcome the actual defilement itself. Uh, and then you are on the right track. Yeah. Usually I recommend, I, th I think for uh, Anger and ill will, this is where this is most useful, because that is the kind of the one problem, the one thing that causes so much havoc and so much problems in our lives. So if you can do it with anger and ill will, you're doing really, really well. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, Adam, I hope it's okay. I wanted to ask uh, maybe a personal question to you. 
um, about your journey into monastic life and um, what the challenges were for you, if there were any, in renouncing to uh, become fully engaged with monastic life. Okay, so uh, I would say, so uh, for me it was kind of, it was strange, for me it sort of happened almost uh, very organically I would say, it happened quite naturally. I, uh, you know, you, uh, I sort of started reading, doing some meditation as a lay person and I had some quite nice experiences in my meditation uh, and I just became interested in meditation practice and uh, kind of uh, uh, spirituality in general, it just sort of happened. I, I went to travel to Asia quite a bit uh, and I, I read some books about Buddhism while I was there and I went to some monasteries and I, you know, the whole thing for me was very kind of, uh, okay, this is, uh, this, this kind of is natural. Uh, um, what was the biggest problem? The biggest problem uh, is always the draw of the world. Uh, yeah, the draw when your meditation isn't going well, uh, uh, when maybe you're finding difficulties with your fellow monastics, usually probably my, probably my fault, but anyway, this, when the, the difficulties are there regardless of whose fault it is. Uh, uh, actually, I don't, I don't, I never think of anything as being my fault or other people's fault. It's just nature happening, the world happening. Yeah, it's no one's fault. It's just difficulties happening in the world. Uh, and whenever there are difficulties like that, and you feel maybe a bit down, or you don't, you don't feel happy, your meditation, things aren't going well, then it's very easy to see the draw of the world. Yeah, very easy to see, oh, I could just relax, I could have a, you know, you, you could have a relationship maybe, or you could have three meals a day, or you could watch entertainment and do all of these kind of things. And these become much more interesting. And that is always the most difficult part. Because we feed on happiness, we feed on joy. Everyone wants to be happy. And the moment the happiness is gone, you're going to look for it somewhere else. And that will then be the world. That's where you look for the happiness. So that is the most difficult thing. So you have to kind of deal with those times through faith. And that is where the faith and the Buddha's teaching really matters enormously. Understanding those teachings uh, to a deep extent, so you have confidence that these teachings really work. And when you have that confidence, then you're willing to go through hard times and, and come out on the other side. And then, of course, when you come out on the other side, then you have learned something. You have understood something more because you take all the difficulties as a learning experience. And then you are wiser when you come out on the other side. And that, of course, becomes then uh, grist for the mill. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the path goes even better as a consequence. So that's kind of uh, roughly how I would, uh, what I would say here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So thank I'll you, take... Abdan. It's yeah, good to see you again. And to, uh, thank yeah. you so much for the teaching today. It was um, relevant as I <laughs> am considering monastic life, but also just a very good teaching in general. Um, so uh, one of my, my question was about your comments about uh, relinquishing the sense of self as kind of this um, this last pronunciation. Um, and this is something I've been reflecting on lately as something that can be sticky <laughs> and get in the way. So I wondered if you had any tips about um, ways of kind of looking at this self as something that's um, not very solid and gets in the way of our ultimately being able to develop yeah. a good spiritual life. I mean, of course, there's reflecting on the khandas and dependent origination, but I wondered if you have any tips or similes or something that can kind of use that, that process along. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the sense of self, how to deal with the sense of self. Um, uh, I, I think, I mean, it's difficult to really fully deal with the sense of self because it is very deeply seated in us. So all you can really do is deal with it in a superficial way and the rest of it will happen down the path because, you know, you need all these other conditions to be in place to be able to see through this sense of self. So, so I would say one of the main ways of dealing with the sense of self is actually just to practice the Noble Eightfold Path. By practicing right speech, by practicing right conduct, by avoiding ill will, etc., etc., you actually, that requires a giving up of the sense of self. It requires a giving up of self-concern, of, uh, of uh, you know, stinginess and all of these kind of things. So you are actually already doing it by practicing those things. It is happening automatically here. 
very often people ask these kind of questions. How do I give up my attachments? How do I give up my sense of self? How do I do all of these profound things? Well, actually, everything really comes back to the Noble Eightfold Path. That is where, you know, the, the problem, that is where all problems are resolved through that particular practice. But uh, it is also useful to reflect on, you know, more directly on the sense of self and the ego. And sometimes you can see how it lands you in trouble all the time. Yeah, it always lands you in the difficulties. That's kind of the, the you know, you end up with uh, arguments or discussions or all kinds of things, or you, you feel hurt. Yeah, you feel hurt. Why do you feel hurt? Well, because the sense of self has been hurt, right? This is such a common experience in our life. And uh, very often you, uh, you know, you, uh, you realize this is just a conditioned response. Uh, there isn't, you know, it doesn't really make any, you know, <laughs> why, why do we feel hurt? And then it's kind of, what does it matter anyway? What other people think, or what other people do? They're just following their own, going to the beat of their own inner drummer, right? And they don't really understand what, uh, what is going on. And very often just by reflecting on this in this way and seeing this kind of ego being a big nuisance leading to all of these kind of problems, uh, you actually, to start to let go of it a little bit and you understand that uh, this kind of um, it's not a real it's not real what is going on there's this kind of this uh, interaction between beings and uh, you're getting hurt for absolutely no reason uh, of course it's part, still is part for the course you shouldn't avoid that hurt you can't just suppress it uh, but you can eliminate it alleviate it a little bit by just uh, uh, kind of giving up a little bit of that self concern and sense of self uh, yeah Anyway, so there you are. Good luck. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Ajahn. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a question. I, I think I kind of know the answer, but I just wondering whether you have any tips, really. I feel like, you know, you've got the, the world, as we call it, and the sensory world, the lay life, and a lot of that, I feel, sort of goes in one direction, and the spiritual life in another and i feel that whenever i'm a naturally i'm a lay person got a family etc it's very hard because i feel like even doing things sometimes with my family has taken me away from the spiritual life so do you have any potentially tips to to yeah how you can make it more more sort of one and and yeah and balance maybe uh, it's nice to see you again, Sean. Anyway, you're the cyclist, right? Is that right? Yes, yeah, nice yeah that's right. <laughs> well remembered. <laughs> the cycling. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is, I think, a very important question. I think it's a question that everyone should really contemplate. Uh, and uh, the, the answer is very simple, but putting it into practice is often quite difficult, right? So I don't envy you the idea of putting it into practice, but the answer is basically just that you have to make everything in your life part of the spiritual path yeah so when you are with your family well what does that mean well it means that how can i care for my family in a way that kind of reflects the dhamma how can i care for my kids or my wife or whatever it is that you whatever relationship it is that you have how can i care for these people who are so close to me in a way that uh, is accords with the dhamma where i'm truly kind truly being a benefit truly doing the right thing yeah and then you are kind of having this idea of service again and you permeate your entire life for this idea of service and kindness and kind of doing something for the world so that will then be your family life it will be your professional life or whatever work it is that you're doing it will be your spiritual life i mean your spiritual friends you also want to treat them in exactly that way you want to be of service for all of these people coming together here and uh, as you as you do that as you kind of apply these teachings to everyone around you without caring yeah you cannot really afford to care too much whether people reciprocate or whether they have any confidence in the dhamma or whether they you know, all of that has to go out the window forget about all of that the only thing you need to be concerned about is your conduct in relation to these other people yeah? and uh, as you do that you start to you know it will actually everything in your life starts to become a part of this path so uh, and and you know family life is a very tricky one i mean i you know i have we have all lived family life you know how hard it can be we are so close to people when you're so close to people it's very easy to rub up against each other very easy to have little arguments and irritations and all these kind of things so it's a very very good training ground if you can deal with family life if you can deal with your family members you can deal with anyone right that's kind of the this is grand ground zero when it comes to kind of the <laughs> the, the, the spiritual practice so uh, 
try yeah that, this is kind of this this is uh, so uh, do your very best in that area and i think it actually it is a potential for a lot a lot of growth in the spiritual path you start to look at your family members in a new way you use the reflection of the buddha of non-self you use this idea that these are your kids are people who came into your life they have a past they already have four personalities there's only so much you can do right with your kids if they are in a certain way it's nothing to do with you. It just has to do with the way they came into the world. Yeah, don't, don't um, live through your kids. Don't think that your person is reflected in your kids' behavior. If my kids behave badly, I will look bad. Forget about all of that, right? That is kind of a self-concern, and start to take this kind of Buddhist outlook, whereby you kind of go with the flow and you start to, uh, yeah, you start to actually implement these teachings fully in in this particular way. Yeah? So uh, I, wish, I wish you good luck, Sean. I'm glad I don't have a challenge, but I... <laughs> That's great. All right. Uh, so um, have we come to the end? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I guess so. should I pass so it's, it's over to, to uh, Shell? Is that right? Yeah. Thank you want to finish? So Yep. Thank you, Ajahn. I've just posted uh, some links in the chat. So thank you so much, Ajahn, for such beautiful and serene meditation and your wisdom this morning. It's so inspiring to hear from you, a bhikkhu supporter and spiritual advisor of Anikampa. And we're so fortunate to be offered the teachings of early Buddhism. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We're very grateful that Ajahn has come this morning. Well, even for Ajahn and given his time to help us with our two aims to promote the teachings and practices of early Buddhism leading to full awakening and help to establish the first forest monastery in England where women can take full bhikkhuni ordination. Thank you so much Ajahn for all your support to Anukampa. It was a delight to hear in the announcements yesterday before the Friday night teaching with Bhante Sujato at the BSWA, the support for Anukampa. Ajahn Brahm is fundraising for Anukampa for his birthday appeal and his tour in November for us was also promoted. We're deeply grateful for the support we received from the BSWA. We're full of metta for Venerable Chanda, who, whose retreat in the USA is coming to an end and she'll be joining the Sangha in Perth later next week for her Reigns retreat. And we continue to support the amazing projects she commits her life to. All these teachings are offered in the spirit of dana, generosity. If you are able, we're asking for your dana towards Anakampa. We have seen the project flourish this past year and wish to continue to support the Bikuni Sangha in the UK and start raising funds to expand from our beautiful Vihara in Oxford to an even bigger abode to house more Bikunis, aspirants and lay supporters. Without the support of the community here this, this morning and the wider community, we wouldn't be where we are today, spreading the teachings of the Buddha to all. If you can, we're asking for monetary donations to support the expansion of Anukampa, however small or big you are able to give. Every penny is so gratefully received to support the Bikuni Sangha and get even closer to having a full more forest monastery for Bikunis in the UK. Please visit the website to donate and the link is in the chat. If you can offer a one -off, you can offer a one-off donation or more regular monthly donations that will really support the project. There will be opportunities for to offer food dana for the Vihara in December onwards and offer your time at the Vihara from the new year. Should you wish to offer these, please email team at anukampaproject.org. Please also see the Anukampa website for the weekly teachings we are being offered by the wonderful Bikunis and Adam Ramali, supporting Anukampa while Venerable Chanda is on retreat as well as Ajahn Brahm's tour uh, and his teachings in November, which are open to booking and Venerable Chanda's retreats and talks she'll be given on her return in the UK, in, uh, sorry, on her return in the UK, the US and Norway. Her retreat next February at Gaia House in Devon in the UK is now open for booking and you can find the link on the Annie Campbell website. She'll be teaching this retreat with Bernard von Kloss, who's a wonderful lay Dharma teacher and he's actually currently completing a PhD in Vedana. Please note that next Sunday we'll be back to our usual time of 7.30 p.m. British summer time and will be a peer-led session with Leah. The following Sunday, the 6th of August, we're delighted to have Ben and Pekka back with us too. With deep gratitude for your time this evening, Ajahn, and thank you all for coming and sharing the Buddha together. Yeah.
Nice to see you all again and take care, everyone. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs>